I'd like to invite Professor Susan Morton and Sir Mason back to the stage to join our panel discussion. Um, and they're going to be taking their seats in, in what is described in stage speech as the lounge room setting. Um, while they're doing that, I'm going to introduce the moderator and questioner for that lounge room discussion, uh, Ms. Karen Brown. Um, many of you in New Zealand will be very familiar with Karen Brown's health reporting. She's New Zealand's premier health journalist and has been the health correspondent for Radio New Zealand for the past 14 years. Um, she has won awards from our own profession and the Colorectal Surgical Society of Australia and New Zealand for her insight documentary into the bowel screening pilot that uh, we ran at Waitemata DHB um, and has also extensive experience as a sub-editor filling in as the nighttime news director, chief reporter and morning report producer as needed. Radio New Zealand sounds rather like the healthcare sector where we're all doing too many jobs. Um, Karen gained an MA in journalism from the University of Missouri, Columbia while in the US and also has a diploma in journalism from Canterbury University and a BA from Victoria University in Wellington. And one thing I did enjoy when we were talking earlier in the week was swapping some notes about the best tramping tracks in New Zealand, which is clearly a passion. Karen, thank you for uh, moderating this discussion. I'd like to just, um, I've got some questions, we, we don't have a lot of time, but I, I've got questions for each of the speakers earlier, and, and um, Professor Susan Morton, if I can start with you. I think that's a lovely quote of Michael Marmots, isn't it, that um, taking action is the key. So we have wonderful research, these longitudinal studies have been preeminent in New Zealand, but are we doing enough as a country to actually centre children's perspectives into our policy as much as we need to. Yeah, thank you for that, Karen. Um, firstly, just to pick up on your point, I think we are very, we're very lucky to have such wonderful research in New Zealand to draw on as well as internationally, and I think we'll hear about the Dunedin study, which has been a huge um, gem for, for many of us for decades, and so that is really important. And I think the reason it's important is because it actually does allow the voices of those who are most vulnerable of those who are most burdened by some of the health issues we are interested in to actually be heard. So no piece of evidence on its own is enough, but I think the voices that those children can bring to the table and that you know, people like me who are privileged enough to be able to collect those voices together and stories together and present them to policymakers or to communities or to other stakeholders, that that is an incredibly important part of Looking at all the evidence, I suppose. Um, I think on its own, though, it, it's never enough. I mean, we've now got big data. You know, we have a huge resource out there and, and alongside some of the voice data that can be really valuable. So I think it's about making the best use of all the resources that we have out there, but not forgetting that we need to listen to those voices. So are we actually making the best use of it uh, and listening enough, or do we... Are we going to keep waiting for, for more data before we take necessary actions? No, I, th I think it's important that we do act now. I think it's important that we don't wait for decades. We're not waiting for the outcomes of the Growing Up in New Zealand study until the children are 21. We're trying to act on it now. So we want timely, real-time evidence to be informing policy. I think it's starting. I think particularly under this government, some of the things we heard from Ashley, some of the things that we heard from the Fana Order program, that there really is an attempt to bring those voices and the lived realities to the table of government, to the policy tables in ways that we perhaps haven't been able to previously, and, and to bring that lens to the table rather than just the lens of those who are potentially in the positions of power, including clinicians. You had background in the UK, and I understand from data on the Ministry's website that basically the UK and Australia are doing better than New Zealanders in terms of health equity. So I wonder if you know why that is, what are they doing that we, um, we could pick up on? I, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think they're doing better in some areas and doing worse in others. We have shameful inequalities, inequities in our population that we've heard a little bit about that really we haven't done enough over the last few decades to make change to. And I do think it is important that as New Zealanders we own that collectively and we start to look for different ways of operating. And that's, again, linking back to hearing the voices, hearing the lived realities, understanding what well-being means to those other groups in the population, so not defining that according to one world view. So I think that, that yes, we can learn 
from those other contexts, and we do, for example, we compare our longitudinal study with the Millennium Cohort study, with growing up in Ireland, with growing up in Scotland, looking at what difference can societal norms, can political environments make to those early life trajectories and set children off on trajectories that are likely to optimise their well-being. So I think, I think there's lots of scope to look. I think we're only just beginning to do that as well as we might as well. Uh, Sir Mason, um, early intervention counts, and you, you showed that very clearly. Um, there are also time constraints, and we know that hospitals are such busy, complex places. What do you think? That where, where could there be scope to improve um, interaction between clinicians um, and, and families, patients, so that we can um, really do better on that front? Yeah, well, I think the part of this, that dilemma is the big gap between primary care and secondary care. It's a huge hurdle. And the links between them are not very strong or certainly not very palpable. So I think it'd be really important that instead of saying that the role of specialists is primarily hospital bound, to see that the role for, for specialists is working with primary health care providers. If I use a number of Maori health providers, and they, some of them have a GP attached to them, some don't. But then their, their difficulty, when they make a referral, they might wait two or three weeks and, or, don't, or nothing happens sometimes. But if the, if the physician or the surgeon or the ophthalmologist was actually linked to one of those community providers, I think that would be a better way of creating a sort of a team approach rather than a two-team approach to the problem. How could that be done? Because it seems to me there's quite a difference around the country in terms of the, the connections, for want of a better word, between primary care and, and the hospital setting. And in some communities, maybe Canterbury, it, it's much more seamless. But other places it's not. And of course, there are pressures on GPs as well, doing more, getting older, shortages. So any suggestions how that could be fostered? Well, I mean, that's uh, how it might work. With it. First of all, if I, I know more about psychiatry and psychiatrists than about physicians. Um, I know in, in psychiatry, there are a huge number, there are large numbers of psychiatrists who are dying for an opportunity to get out of the acute ward. And I think that as long as we regard the centre for health being somehow the centre for specialist services, like an acute psychiatric service, we don't make progress. So there's that fundamental shift that the centre for healthcare, I think, should be based in communities. The hospitals have a contribution, but the centre lies with communities. Does that begs the question, and your earlier example um, of the experience of a hospital, you couldn't have the families in there because they, they didn't have a funding connection, so they, it couldn't be achieved. I mean, do we need to be looking again at the district health board structure? to see if there are changes that could help. Maybe something Ashley might want to tackle as well, but I mean, do we need to look at our, our overall you know, um, organizations and, and, and the levers that they use? No, I think you're right. I think there was a question for Andrew. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Ashley, your time to come in. Um, what, what about that? I mean, you addressed the Waitangi, the why tangy tribunal hearings, that was a really interesting session, and you talked about the possibility of the need for um, more accountability, more, more monitoring even, um, to obviously to try to improve or achieve health equity. Indeed, yeah. Uh, look, thanks, uh, Karen. And it's, this is not a hospital pass from Mason. I should have some ideas, having been a, a DHB chief executive. Uh, so, look, I think the structural changes might support it, but we also, there are a lot of levers in the current system, um, and what it takes, of course, is, is courage to use those differently uh, and to really explore new models of care. So one example being the value I've seen in implementing what's called the healthcare home model in primary care, and some DHBs are, have done this, uh, not only because it does open up this opportunity, as Mason's talked about, to... Uh, to provide care differently 
for individuals and, and family whānau. But it also provides a sort of a, a structure in the community into which you can plug specialist advice and or support from, for example, allied health professionals, physio, OT and so on. So a model like that, which actually the additional cost was marginal, it was actually just using the existing funding differently. But it was also, it's been profoundly empowering for the, for the GPs and primary care staff doing it because it's given them uh, an opportunity to do things differently, to free up their time, to be able to focus where they need to, more time and attention on, uh, on, on individuals in, in whānau that have higher needs, and to be able to deal with others who may not need a face-to-face -face consultation, but without there being the pressure of revenue or something, some other, some other um, disincentive to do so. So, Ashley, the government has, has told the Ministry um, it needs to take bold steps. It's mandated the Ministry, it's instructed you to do more um, on the health equity front. Mm. And, I mean, as we mentioned earlier before this session began, I mean, health equity, it's a real buzzword. Every media release that comes out ensures, make sure that they mention the equity word because everyone knows it's... It's, it's, a, it's a key word now, but what, are you, what is the Ministry going to do to actually um, take bold steps, take new directions, and, and try and um, show that we can actually do more on this front? Thanks, Karen. So I, I think the, the first principle is that it needs to infuse all our work. So yes, I've re-established a Māori Health Directorate within the organisation, but it's not the responsibility of the Māori Health Directorate to, to sort this out. Uh, yes, they can provide some very important leadership and furthermore ensure that we are addressing both treaty obligations as well as our broader equity agenda. I, I'd see the role of the Ministry as really supporting the sector to identify practical things that can be done and yes, we can look to other countries like, we can look to other jurisdictions like Australia and the UK, but we have some very good examples here and the Fano Ora approach is one such approach. We can look to what other is, examples. Is, sorry to interrupt you, Ashley, but what's happened to Whanauora? Because, I mean, I'm the health correspondent. I haven't heard the word mentioned until Sir Mason did a few, few minutes ago. I mean, uh, does it still exist? Um, it does, yes. And, in fact, there was a review done of uh, the work of uh, the outcomes of Whanauora work to date, which was very positive. And one of the conclusions from that review, which we're picking up on, is that there is an opportunity for those delivering or, or I guess, um, supporting the delivery of whānauora to work much more closely with the health sector and in fact the onus is on the health sector to, um, to lean in to that opportunity. I think one of the notions I'd like to, to put on the table too is we need to be much more thoughtful about this idea of proportionate universalism. And a very good example here where we've been successful is around our immunisation rates, where we languished, particularly in our rates for Māori and Pacific children in the mid-60s or 70s until probably 10 years ago, where with a concerted effort that acknowledged that for some children it would require significant additional investment to get that last few percent of children but that investment was made, and in fact the benefit was seen, and those um, unequal vaccination rates between Māori and non-Māori were closed in many areas. It's been, a, it's been a bit of a relapse recently, which we're very focused on addressing. But I think we have examples of what it takes, and we need to be very deliberate about implementing initiatives that will address those inequities. We have excellent examples, as you said, in the immunisation front, and when also Māori smoking, uh, that's, that's had, had effects. Um, I don't think uh, progress on rheumatic fever is going quite as well as we'd hoped. So what I want to ask is, um, what can we do better? Are we going to continue to use these sorts of programmes and, and hope for the best, or, or what other ways can we um, use research, the things that we know, to, um, to drive change, because otherwise it seems to, it's going to take a long time, isn't it? It's not, we're not going to get there quickly. Sure. Well, I think, you know, again, a, pre a prerequisite, of course, for making progress is having a mandate to do it. And I think a wellbeing framework, a wellbeing approach provides that. I don't think we should overlook the importance of investments like those to address child poverty yeah. that this government has made, and indeed the previous government had made, had made. Addressing child poverty will go a long way towards addressing some of the health outcomes that we see, like the very high rates of rheumatic fever amongst Māori and Pacific, relatively. Uh, so 
we, you know, we've got a, a government that is not only committed to, but is expecting the public service to work and, and to take a, that broad lens across. So I think we have a strong mandate. It's now our job, again, to use that notion of lean into that and, you know, and to think about what else can we do to address those underlying determinants. Could I ask um, Sir Mason a question? Um, Sir Mason, you've got just decades, such a wealth of experience. I wonder, are you at all disappointed that it's taking so long for changes in this area to occur? And is there one thing that you would perhaps like to see in the next budget, which is this month? Well, it's probably a bit late to get my point into, it, <laughs> into the budget right now. I suspect it's been written. But is there one thing that I think would make a significant change is to shift the locus of control into communities and into iwi. That, that's really what Whānau Water has done. The commissioning model that the Whānau Water use has really shifted the focus away from the conventional um, institutions, departments, into a local uh, collective. In the South Island, nine iwi have come together and they provide the structure for it. In the North Island, it's a different, different one. There's a much more of an uh, urban Māori approach. But that, I think, shifting, that, shifting the focus, that really health is so important, I think it's got to be the control, to a large extent, has got to move towards where the people are. Susan, what would you like to see in the budget? <laughs> uh, yes. That well, could I, help with this. Late. Um, I think, I, think uh, pr I want to pick up probably on, on the sort of points that both Mason and Ashley have made and that idea of proportionate universalism. So I'd like to see there be funding to support more than universal strategies because what we can see in universal strategies is often an increase in inequity because of access issues. And I'd like to see the idea of community voice, of individual voice, particularly of iwi voice, being more a lens that we look at our context-specific issues from and actually allow that, as, as we have tried to do in a very small way, to empower those communities who are most burdened with some of these issues to actually help us find the solutions that we're searching for. So, Ashley, any comment on how communities, primary care, can um, actually be helped to do more, to to try to, um, you know, from the ground up, because we know that district health boards are, you know, they're, they're fully, um, they've, they've got a lot of issues, they've got lots on their plate, including financial issues. So if primary care is going to do more and, and the communities, how, how is that going to be supported by the ministry? So, Karen, um, I'm glad you didn't ask me if I had any comment on the budget, because I obviously can't uh, comment on, on that. Uh, Look, uh, again, it's, we're not asking, I don't think we should be asking primary care to do more. I think we should be asking ourselves, how do we better use our collective capability, capacity, resources, and so on? And we have an amazingly well-trained and effective workforce in New Zealand. Um, we have the resources we've got. We have um, incredibly innovative people. Uh, so how do, we, how do we actually better use that to um, provide the care that people need. And I agree with Mason, the setting is the community setting. Um, and in fact, of course, most people's healthcare home is their own home. That's where they, they, they deliver the majority of their health uh, care, both preventive and, and, um, and treatment. So I think we should be, again, raising our, our gaze somewhat, our horizon, and thinking, what's our collective capability and capacity, not what are the constraints? How do we collectively support individuals, family whānau, communities to, to realise their aspirations. The healthcare home movement has obviously helped GPs a lot to, to do more. Any other initiatives like that that we could, because obviously they're, they're working, they're very, working very hard. Yeah. Uh, look, I think that's a, a, a good, it's a good model. What it is is, is a, an example of taking a model, uh, adapting it, uh, from overseas, adapting it to the New Zealand context and trying it out and getting people enthused and resourcing it properly. What I'm really um, keen to see, I think we haven't touched on it too much, although Mason did, is what we might be able to do in terms of ment mental health and particularly um, uh, addressing mental health needs in the community settings and primary care settings. So I think there's a huge opportunity there for new models. And again, we're trying some out at the moment that are showing great promise. So the, me the message I'm getting is carry on, we're on the right track and, and we'll get there, is, is that it? 
<laughs> Anyone yet? Yeah. I think we're in, we're in a good environment to get to yes. a new space, but I don't think we can just keep doing what we've always done. There is a need to actually keep examining what we're doing and do things better and do things differently, actually, to challenge the norms. Yeah. Um, but, but I do think we are in a climate and environment where that is welcome, where well-being is what we're aiming for, for fiscal sustainability. So let's embrace that and actually run with it. We're also in a climate where there are so many competing demands. Sure. Um, and uh, you know, I worry that it's taken it. Sir Mason's been talking about this sort of thing for a long time and um, just wondered if there's any, any, any change in approach needed or will we get there if we carry on using the excellent longitudinal studies. But there's, there's, I think there, there's, there's room, for, room for optimism. Um, and, and when you look around, you see some communities taking things into their own hands and doing absolutely remarkable things. There's a program called uh, Iron Māori, and that's set up for uh, Māori who want to do a tr half uh, marathon. That they're not, most, well, there's about 10% of them are what you call athletic. Um, 40 or 50% would like to be athletic but never quite made it. And, and the others are probably in it because they want to stay alive. And it's a health promotion program in its biggest way. And so you get families involved in it. Uh, they close the registration seven minutes after they open it because they have more people than they can cope with. And it's, they spend the, the huge changes in lifestyle, huge uh, enthusiasm for being together. Whānau take on quite different perspectives. And I think that's, that's a health promotion program which just started from the ground. Uh, that's what I see as a, a really, a, a, we can be optimistic when we look at something like that. Right. So more of those initiatives, if we have the right mindset and we're going the right direction, yeah, things need, will happen. They need support, but there are initiatives that actually bear fruit in ways that we as professionals would have trouble doing. Cool. Karen, we have about two or three more minutes to wrap up. Right. So... Um, Let's think, what else might we want to know? I, I was actually really interested if you ha had any more thoughts on, um, I was alarmed to read in, in the Ministry's report on its website, dating September last year, that the UK and Australia are doing better than us in New Zealand on health equity. And um, I'm just interested in um, why that would be so. And may, maybe in the United Kingdom, being such a melting pot of people, they, um, they've learnt to look at differences and deal with differences. On the other hand, they've got their financial pressures. So I just wondered if anyone's got any insights into really, obviously, well, we have, um, Australia doesn't have, uh, you know, it doesn't have a high proportion of Aboriginal people, so that wouldn't affect, you know, that would affect their figures. But actually, what do you think? You're new to the ministry um, on this. Any, any ideas that we could pick up from anywhere else that you're interested in? Uh, well, of course, and I think that we're actually pretty good at, um, at identifying good ideas and, and initiatives from elsewhere. However, I do think we need to, uh, particularly when we think about improving outcomes and wellbeing for Māori, we need to be, we need to be um, bedding that into our understanding of uh, the treaty relationship, what that means for this country, and what it means for the delivery of, um, of health and healthcare. So I talk with my team about co constantly thinking about people's access to experience of and outcomes from care, and thinking about, and that could be preventive as well as treatment, uh, thinking about that lens in everything we do. I've also exhorted my senior le uh, leaders just a few days ago to have a real focus on delivery and on implementation. Yes, we can provide great policy advice, that's part of our job, we can do a lot of things, but actually we're here to facilitate delivery of improvement, delivery of benefits to address equity, and that's gonna require us to be courageous. It's gonna require us, bureaucracies are incredibly risk averse um, uh, in the way they're set up, but it's going to require us to be just really well grounded, to be values driven, to be authentic, and to be courageous in what we do. So that's, um, uh, the team, our organization has a license to do that, and we have a, 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 po a set of policy settings that the government's put in place that I think will support that. So now's the time. Now is the time. Every time. Yeah. Now is always the time. It, I won't ask yes. you if it's going to be in the budget because you, you can't discuss that. Yes. But 
hopefully there will be something in the budget. We know the budget will focus on mental health and it can't do everything. But Susan, um, is there any, any, any time that you see wonderful research and findings from the work that you're doing and others and you just don't see it being picked up and put into policy and you think, well, that is a missed opportunity? I think the, the reality of making policy is that it's much more complex than having the evidence that from good research. So you, you want, and, and we, have a, we have partnerships with agencies that allow us to take lived realities to that policy table, but we have to understand that that piece of evidence is alongside the other constraints and, and the you know, different values and different processes that need to be put in place. So the first thing I think is making sure that you're representing honestly those voices who are part of, in this case, growing up, but it could be other pieces of research as well, and so that is a responsibility. I guess you do want to see that make a difference. That's the reason that we're doing this research, and so it's not a matter of leaving it at the door and saying, here you go. It's actually about sitting down and saying, what can we do with this? Um, I do think just sort of picking up on what we know from the most current research out of New Zealand in this space about that first thousand days though, that we do need to think about being bold and, and being ambitious and doing things differently because we know that our Māori and our Pacifica populations are growing at a much faster rate than anybody else in our population. And yes, we have different rates of inequities, but we also have a different population mix and our future is very different. And if we don't start to address the inequalities we see today, which is what we're all talking about, in two generations, we're going to see those inequalities widening. So doing enough is not enough. We need to do things differently, and, and evidence becomes part of that. Um, and you know, I see it as my job to take that evidence to the table and have it heard. Do you see a challenge at all in terms of bringing the rest of New Zealand along on this journey? Because I, I don't think that that challenge is something that's difficult to share within families, within homes. I think people understand that their lived reality is shaped in a life course way. They understand that their here and now is a product of everything that's happened within their own life course, but also across generations, and is influenced by the way they are able to engage or not engage in wider society. So I don't think the ideas themselves are challenging. I think operationalising them is challenging. And I think moving beyond the theory and moving beyond what I sort of call risk factorology, this idea that we can understand all the things that underlie issues, and poverty is clearly a pervasive one. The challenge for us is what do we do that works? What do we do to make change? Not just what do we do to reduce those risk factors. So that, I think, is something that, again, when you take those stories out to communities, to iwi, to groups, they can understand that. And so I, d I don't think the challenge is in translation. So Karen, I think oh. we probably yeah, do need to it. wrap up at this point. Thank you. Um, I really would like to thank all of our speakers, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield, Professor Susan Morton, Sir Mason Durie, and Karen Brown. I think this has been an extraordinary and insightful session. To bring some of those threads together, perhaps, uh, doing enough is not enough. Um, I think that's one of the key messages for me. And as we leave this session, I would challenge each of you to think, what am I going personally to do differently in my clinics with the whanau who visit me? Can I reach out better into my communities and out of the hospital environment that most or many of us practice in? How can I be a better advocate? If advocacy is giving voice to those who don't have it, how can my voice as a clinician be better used for change? And I think on the background we've heard today, I would challenge all of you to leave thinking, how can I make more of a difference? So I'd like to thank all our speakers, and I'm sorry we intruded a little into lunch. We started a little late from the morning session, and I've kept you from some needed sustenance, but thank you for your attention. <laughs>